want to do the intro and then I'll pop myself in on the video. Hey everybody, welcome to the Renew Show and we want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, we actually have a very special show. It's actually going to be a 90 minute show. Um, and well, before I get to who the guest is and why it's special, I'm actually going to ask uh, my host just to say hello as well, starting with um, the beautiful cold woman out in Fresno. <laughs> yes, I'm freezing. This is Gastric Rose. Hi, guys. Y'all see my, my beautiful snowman today? <laughs> Happy holidays. I'm glad to see uh, we have a chef on, and we're going to have lots of questions for him. I hope uh, that you have a lot of questions in mind for him today. Welcome. Okay, and Lori? Hi, everybody. I want to apologize for my voice. I've been sick, but I could not miss tonight's show. Welcome. I hope you enjoy our very special guest, Mr. Nick Pierce, who is the host of a nutrition food network show called Home Cooking Overhaul. And Kali. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I don't count. Um... <laughs> I have my interpreter in case my voice goes to. Y'all know Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks, Jesse, for helping out. No problem. Um, okay, guys, so I have to say we're testing out a new feature. I don't even know how it's going to work, but this question and answer um, feature that's a part of Google Hangouts. So if you guys are watching live, on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, it should say, be part of the conversation. Click to join live Q&A on Google Hangouts. So if you click that, then something should happen. Actually, you should be able to be taken to kind of a uh, chat session, and anything you type, we'll be able to see it. So it's kind of like the way it was before, where you actually get a chat and not just um, you typing comments and hoping someone else sees it. So... With that said, I'll give you guys a second to go do that. Make sure you can um, you can see that. Hopefully, we'll be able to interact a little smoother that way. And I'm actually going to turn it over to our guest, Nick Pierce. He's going to tell you a little bit about himself, his background, and then talk a little more about the show that he has going. Well, great, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm Nick Pierce, and I'm host of Home Cooking Overhaul. It's a TV show that... Uh, I go out and I visit fast homes to teach them how to cook uh, good meals and get away from the fast food and fro dinners and pre-packed meals, pretty much. Um, I pretty much go and do all the food shopping, come in, I evaluate diets, and I sit down with the family and try to figure out exactly what they're doing wrong, and not just to help them eat better, but also save money and cook good food the quality needs that are available to you at a fraction of the price that you could have to go out and buy a meal for. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, so, I mean, how did you get started in that? I mean, I'm sure a lot of us would just like to have a TV show, but like, how did you get started? What was your background, and then what made you want to do something like this? Well, my background, um, oh, gee, how did I get... Uh, my my uh, my parents bought me a drum set when I was four years old, and I took them with it. Uh, I guess maybe that put me in front of a camera. Uh, but from a culinary standpoint, I was um, I I love cooking. And when I went away to college, I was living in a dorm my first semester, and no one knew how to cook and, and really know how to cook either. I ate a lot of uh, minute steaks and. Uh, the I call it noodley stuff. It's uh, Lipton or whatever noodles in the egg that you just add water to and make it a uh, trick. It happens, and everybody I think probably did a good maybe 18 to 20 pounds for almost every credit they had in college. And I decided that uh, I wanted to expand a little bit and teach people how to. Um, I took a little better, and so through my own experimentation, I decided to um, start writing down some recipes, and I, um, later on in life, eventually, uh, I started, made a website, recipes on it, and people realized that, wow, these are actually good, easy to do, and don't take a lot of time or uh, the bank doing, 
because uh, pretty much I adapted a lot of them just to, you know, work with a, you know, little budget that I had at the time. But also, um, so that you're not eating a lot of that prepackaged and pre-made stuff that is probably no good for you to begin with. We already have questions for you, Nick. <clears throat> Nick, somebody's asking. Um, we have a. We have a. Oh well. Wow. We have a viewer. Okay. We have a viewer named Rob Reno, and he's asking. He he eats fish five times a week, and he loves salmon, and he wants to know what the best way to cook salmon is, but in a simple and easy way. Um, what's nice about salmon, it's a beautiful fish. Um, it has a great flavor to it, and it's a strong, um, a very strong flavor, but yet it's not too fishy if done right. I love fish myself, and uh, salmon is a fish that I didn't care for too much until I recently shot an episode where someone demanded their house and show them how to cook seafood. Well, the, the family I, I went to lived in the Midwest in Ohio, and you're landlocked, so where do you get good fish? Salmon is a fish that's sustainable and actually freezes quite well. Uh, tuna is another one. So I came up with a recipe, and it's actually called um, Super Salmon, I think I called it, and it was uh, an, an ad adaptation that um, was a recipe that my mother sent me. And I loved it. It actually rekindled my, um, uh, my passion for salmon, I guess you could say. But it's very easy. Take the fish. I don't care for skin. Uh, everybody's different. Um, you can skin it or, or you can get it um, fresh, always best. Um, but it's one of those fish that even if you're landlocked, you can actually And it tastes pretty good, believe it or not, for a frozen fish. Uh, take this salmon, marinate it. And maybe garlic, uh, oregano, basil, olive oil, and leave the refrigerator for maybe about an hour to two hours in a glass bowl. Don't use anything metallic because you never want to marinate anything in the metallic way. It just has an off flavor, especially when you use an acid like a lemon juice or vinegar in the marinade. Um, or even a plastic bag is fine. Uh, marinate that for about an hour to two hours. Put all that in some foil. Each fillet in its own little foil wrap and make a little package for it. Put it in the oven about 325 and uh, leave it in there at about, um, well, for about, I'm going to say 20 to 40 minutes, depending on the size of the salmon and the fillet you have. And what's nice about salmon is it's bold enough to stand up to strong flavors. So, uh, it with it. And that's just one of my ideas. Um, you can you can use it with it because it's almost like a steak. Um, it's it's very strong. It can stand up to some um, more pungent flavors that you normally wouldn't want to slice fish that's more delicate like a uh, tilapia or a halibut. Hmm. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Um, that one's delicious. <laughs> So we got a question. I want to make sure I get to the, some of the ones that were emailed in. I got a question from Fior, and they asked, how long should vegetables be cooked without stripping away their nutrients? A lot of it depends on the vegetable. Um, there are, I, I kind of vegetables into two categories. I'm sure a lot of experts may uh, split it up in more. Uh, below ground vegetables such as carrots and uh, above ground vegetables such as we'll say broccoli and a spinach. I'd say it all depends on the uh, to the vegetable. I typically like vegetables and a lot of people do. Most people have a tendency to overcook their vegetables and leave them steaming and boiling and, and they add too much. Uh, they're on the heat. Uh, what I would recommend is um, if you frozen uh, vegetable, it may take a little more time, but bring it in temperature and then put it in whatever it is you want to cook in. 
Um, whether you're doing a stir fry or just uh, steaming it or heating it up on the side or as a meal on its own. Um, when vegetable is crisp and has its color and it looks like it's garnish, then uh, if it's warm through the vegetable, it's good to eat. If you overcook it, I'm going to say you really don't lose a lot of nutrients. I've done some research on this where a lot of folks will say that if you overcook it, everything boils or steams or cooks out of it. But um, scientifically, just from what I've learned, once you're cooking a vegetable in a broth that it's been made in, the nutrients move back into it. Um, I don't like like vegetables and a crisp vegetable um, to me has a great texture when you actually get it in your mouth but um, I wouldn't say you're actually losing a nutrient I think that it could be eventually killed if you do it the wrong way so um, I mean if you torch it and uh, throw it on a fire don't expect the charcoal to taste good I think if that has changed its chemical properties and it has hello Okay, what just happened? I don't know. <laughs> well, we're all here. Well, uh, you can you I... hear me? Can you hear me, Cully? Yep. You can hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know where everybody went. All of a sudden, my screen went blank. I don't know if anybody's watching, but I, got, I was getting text saying that nobody could hear Nick. Oh, all right. I don't even know. Are we live? Uh, yeah, it says live. Hi, everybody. Okay. So, all right. We don't know what just happened. <laughs> oh, man. I'm telling you, Google really doesn't like us. And when you look at the screen, we see it in another language. So, yeah, apparently we are live right now. And I don't know if we have roles right now. <laughs> or, um, <laughs> Nick, can you hear us at least? <laughs> we can move on. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. All right, we're going to have to sing. You ready, Khalif? <laughs> well, you should sing with your, your voice. That would. <laughs> I, I'll be Peter Brady from uh, the Brady Bunch. Well, right. it's time to change. So, obviously, there are some crazy technical difficulties going on right now. We're trying to get everything back together. We didn't know, know we were live when it came back. Um if you couldn't hear everything Nick was saying about the vegetables, the one thing he did say that I um, that I actually didn't know was that if you're you know steaming or boiling a vegetable in and it stays in the same broth, that the um, nutrients are basically cooking back into it, especially if you're using the broth for other things. So um, yeah, there you go. So you don't have to worry about it if you're cooking it that way. But he was saying if you kind of just torch it or throw it on a grill or something for a long time, you're changing the chemical properties and therefore getting rid of a lot of the nutrients. So It's, you know, almost, it's almost backwards because I always thought if you boil vegetables, it pulls it away. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I guess it makes sense since you're cooking it in the same in the same water, and you know whatever you put in the water, it usually gets soaked into the vegetables anyway. So. Yeah, I it, guess that's a good point. Oh. I just uh, and I I hope my signal didn't um get lost. I had a I don't know something melted down, but uh, I just rejoined you as you were saying that the. Um, where you're changing the properties, just throwing it on the grill. I don't know if we're still talking about that now. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it just like if you torch any or burn it from uh, a You're frozen. Uh, frozen again. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right, we, we don't know what's going on, and I'm getting a lot of uh, texts now from people saying, what's going on? If it's not always good to the teeth. Um, Jersey's in the house. We don't disappoint. We represent. <laughs> <laughs> Nick should have never, never moved away from Jersey then. No, Nick used to live in Wayne, New Jersey. Oh, see? <laughs> Nick, are you Probably still not. there? <laughs> I, I did. I did. I did. <laughs> uh, went to Wayne Valley High School. Yes. 
You're going in and out. A lot of people saying that they can't hear you. Should I just move away? Uh, you know, I grew up in Wayne, New Jersey. Uh, went. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe, right. maybe, maybe there's a drag there. Everything just melted down on my end. I got a big error. We can hear you now. All right, let's move on. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Wait, Good. A, all right. There's a question here. Um, sure. Martha loves white rice, but it makes her very lethargic and tired. She wants to know if brown rice is better. I lost everybody. <laughs> Nick, what kind of? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Live TV. Ah. Nick, what kind of rice is better, brown or white? Um, Are you just say brown? It's a half, <laughs> half of one, half a dozen. And uh, I say quinoa. <laughs> yeah, I we knew you were wrong. <laughs> I love me quinoa. <laughs> if you want, you could just take the white one rice, just add some sauce. It tastes good. Um, <laughs> it, it's a half. Um, I wouldn't say this rice that um, is actually making her feel tired. I'd actually probably talk to a doctor. Maybe there's something. That has to do with either um, some type of an allergy or something in the body that it may be uh, doing. And and the other thing you got to look at is how much rice is she eating and, and the overall carbohydrates that the rice may give you. I'm sure that from a dietary level that may play. And again, everybody's different. Um, some people think that turkey makes them tired. However, just because they're exhausted from the traveling and everything, the holidays involved. So. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, one rice is going to make you feel more vibrant. Um, I, I've never heard of anything like that. Um, so my concern um, with you would, would be to actually uh, check with the doctor and see if there's something else. Not just white rice, but maybe anything that actually contains anything with gluten. Maybe there's a gluten allergy. Um, anything that may have to do with like white flour or... Um, yeah, anything like that. Nick, somebody's asking. All right, I think we're all right now because I can I think so too. Somebody's asking, I don't know who this person is, do you have any chocolate desserts? <laughs> Was that you, Khalif? Where are you seeing? No, that's uh, Susan. Any low-calorie chocolate dessert recipes? Oh, okay. I thought that was you, Khalifa. Let's <laughs> make your friend. Nick, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Um, she was asking a question. I think I heard uh, something about chocolate chip recipes, too. I got a little hungry there. <laughs> <laughs> can you recommend any healthy chocolate recipes? Low calorie. Healthy chocolate recipes? Yeah. You know what? Any Anything... <laughs> recipe is healthy in moderation, I guess. Um, healthy chocolate recipes, low calorie. <laughs> but um, um, you know, chocolate flavoring can go a long way. Um, you don't need to everything chocolate necessarily need to be. Um, you know, any time you want with chocolate, doesn't need to be a chocolate bar or anything. Um, you can use cocoa powder just like you can use coffee beans to flavor different meats and try maybe just, just a little bit in like a pork or a chicken dish and you'll still get some of that chocolate flavor it'll enhance a lot of what you're doing and uh, you still enjoy that chocolate flavor another thing you may want to look at is uh, maybe trying to cook or try to do something with maybe a chocolate liqueur 
as opposed to just a solid block chocolate and trying to make a big heavy dessert out of it. So incorporate some of that sweet um, into your dish and and see what happens. And and you can go online and you'll see uh, quite a few recipes uh, that a lot of uh, you know sites may have listed to find some inspiration for that. Alright, I'm looking at a question from Zen Maiden. <clears throat> she wants to know what your view oh, wait, I just lost it. What is your view of the overall effect of sugar replacements and alcohol substitutes in cooking? Does protein powder denature or devalue <laughs> when heated in cooking? What's your view of sugar replacements when you cook? I don't have a lot of experience. I don't have a lot of uh, experience in the protein powder um, uh, fad uh, that, that seems to be coming around. However, uh, substitute uh, sweetener substitutes I'm not a big fan of because there are certain things that natural sweeteners have that the substitute doesn't. And when you're cooking, Using the substitute doesn't necessarily benefit the dish, nor does using the natural thing really impact the dish heavily. And a problem with that is uh, tomato sauce or cutting down the acidity in anything. Uh, if you have a um, <coughs> a gallon of red tomato sauce or marinara sauce that's being on the stove, typically about 15 minutes before it's done. I'll typically put about a tablespoon to two tablespoons of regular cane sugar, white sugar, granulated sugar, into the pot. And what that does is it helps neutralize the acidity and it be that heartburn or anything like that. If you put artificial sweetener into that, um, I'm going to say you ruined my mother's recipe, but I don't see where culinarily it would really benefit the dish because it doesn't have the same natural properties that um, uh, and the real sugar would have to offset the acidity in it. As far as using uh, alcohol substitutes, there are quite a few that you can use. There's uh, uh, two things that you look at in that, and when you cook with alcohol or anything alcohol-based, is is it on the heat long enough to burn the alcohol off, and are you just using it for flavor? Were you cooking for someone or maybe yourself that just doesn't want to have anything to do with alcohol to begin with? Uh, alcohol is used for many different things such as, we'll say, deglazing a pan, which once you cook something in a pan, if you put something with alcohol in it, whether it's white wine or red, or red wine, it contributes to the foundation of a sauce that you're going to start to make that eventually will be put on the dish later on. Um, you can use, in some examples, instead of white wine, you can use some lemon juice, but keep in mind whatever you do will augment the flavor. If there's, uh, it's for the purposes of not wanting to have any alcohol involved in your dish, um, you can substitute lemon, orange, um, and lime is another good one with some strong acidity to be able to glaze that pan or deglaze that pan and build the the sauce the recipe may call for. Typically though, um, I wouldn't say that alcohol is anything to really worry about in your dish if it's at high temperatures because the alcohol will burn off. Um, so if you're afraid that you're going to fly off the wagon if you have something with some Marsala wine in it, um, it's, it's your own preference but um, in my opinion I still use wine in my sauces and I'm not flying out to the bar as a raging drunk and coming home at 6 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got a, actually a question from a uh, fellow, uh, I'm not going to call her a chef because she'll probably get mad, but a great cook from Ohio. Um, Brooke, okay. Mom, she asked, are you going growing any fresh herbs indoors this winter? Yes, there. Um, I love fresh herbs. I'm a big fan. And although I am not um, that, no, I my my thumbs are not green. My nails are always painted black. Um, but I do make a valiant attempt at actually paint um, 
well, not painting, growing uh, vegetables indoors, painting my nails, and I look good. Uh, what I find works well inside, and this is from what I've heard and from experience, and this is a recent endeavor that, I, that I'm venturing down, a new path I'm venturing down. Um, rosemary works well, and uh, for some I reason do. catnip can withstand the temperatures. <laughs> and also, um, for some reason, since you're in Ohio, I am too. I don't know where um, you're located exactly. I'd say that... Um, Onion and garlic seem to grow even outside around now. Um, even green onion and chive actually work well. And I work with uh, someone, and she's my crew, and we're also very good friends, um, who is all about the growing and the, and the uh, natural um, indoor gardening and rooftop gardening and deck gardening and container gardening and all that. Um, so I'm actually sitting here in the midst of a bunch of plants, which you probably cannot see. <laughs> in this shot, um, which I'm waiting to dive into once they reach more mature age. Um, I've had a, a harvest already indoors alone just of rosemary um, that actually was planted um, in late summer. Uh, that to me seems to be one of the more successful herbs that have grown. Uh, um, I'd give anything a shot. Um, hey, if, if drug dealers can grow marijuana in their house, why can't we grow parsley and basil? Give it a shot. Okay. See what happens. <laughs> what do you put rosemary on? Everything? Because I think I don't put it on everything. No. Um, I, rosemary. I use uh, a couple different ways. I use this to actually skewer smaller pieces of meat and uh, roast them in the oven. Um, when I strip the leaves off, I'll typically leave the stems laying around for the next night and do something with them. I like doing rosemary with marinades, steak. Um, or I also use it on um, even that salmon recipe I was mentioning earlier is good. Mm. I also have another recipe, and this is on my website. If you go to nickpearsfood.com, you'll see some recipes, link to all my recipes that I have available online. There's a, uh, I believe it's a lemon's Mary uh, tilapia, and you could also do it with chicken. And uh, I like using it here and there um, for a lot of different things. Sounds good. <clears throat> I haven't eaten. Um, I'm hungry. <laughs> see, that's what you, get. you have to use rosemary in your stuff, Rose. Right? I think it'll um, make me some tilapia. <laughs> I, I got a, another question that was emailed in from Fior. Um, they asked, how much protein should a person have throughout the day? You know what? I'd say that would depend on your body mass and your weight. And you need to keep your system working right. I'm the type of person that I'll sit and eat a steak all day. I mean, I've been to some of those steak eating competitions, steak houses, where you get a 72 ounce sirloin and your name goes up on the wall. Um, you know, but I guess that's strictly out of leisure and not uh, dietary. But um, I would, it's, it's hard to say. It would all depend on, on how big or small of a person you really are. So, Nick, on your show, Home Cooking Overhaul, when you go into somebody's house and you clean out their refrigerator and you teach them what to buy and what to cook, how do you judge what to buy and what to cook? Do they give you, let's say, a medical diagnosis like diabetes? Are they following Weight Watchers? Like, How do you decide what's good for them and how they, that you can help them tailor their eating plan? Oh, that, that's a great question, and sometimes it's kind of challenging. Um, what happens is a crew goes out before the episode is actually shot with a camera, and they sit down and they do an interview with the family or the individual that needs, our, needs my help. And we do an interview, we get an idea of their lifestyle, their background, what they like to eat, and uh, um, with the cameras, then we look through their kitchen, see what they have available to cook with, see what condition their kitchens, and we get a good feel of what they really need and what they require. Um, before the hand, though, we actually do a phone interview, and we'll screen them, and exactly, are they, is this just something to be on TV and they just want free food, or do they really have a genuine need um, to either 
um, cook better, learn how to cook, period, um, change their diet, lose weight, process. And there, there are times when it's hard for someone on the crew to get a first-hand view or insight that I would need. And so I actually have a disguise that I would wear because I'm hard to miss. Um, I actually do wear a disguise and go, I pose as a camera operator or a, a technical guy just flipping around cable to actually get an inside view of what actually needs to happen. Uh, particularly... I have a couple different people that I consult. Um, uh, this gentleman, uh, Joe Palmer, he's he's one. He um, he he. So when I was working with a couple who had a, a diabetes problem and all some gluten allergies and all that, he's also a, a local caterer and he caters uh, events. Uh, he was my go-to person since I don't have any like first-hand experience uh, cooking or any recipes that really aren't going to kill this person, um, I needed to make sure that what I was doing was uh, going to benefit them and not, um, our, our insurance policy wouldn't have to cover a funeral. So um, I called on his help. So I have consultants and experts in certain fields and facets that I'll call on uh, to make sure that everybody survives an episode beyond me just walking in there and saying this place is a mess and you need to clean it up. <clears throat> Crazy Running Mom is asking you, she has tons of beef roasts in her freezer. Besides pot roast, what are some other braising ideas? Um, actually, you know what? I love using, the, it's a cheap cut of meat, and when I would entertain um, friends or family that would come over, um, I get requests to make stroganoff. Chili is a good one. Um, now that it's uh, depending on where it is, um, it's it's starting to drop in temperature here. Uh, those are great cuts of meat to use for chili. I do uh, beef stroganoff instead of using sirloin steak. Hey, you know what? If you're on a budget, take that pot roast and those uh, those roasts. Uh, if you want, trim it down on some of the fat. Um, and break it into smaller pieces or strips and do a beef stroganoff with that. And beef stroganoff is easy. Tomato paste, Worcestershire sauce, brown it with some onions in the pan, simmer it until it's tender and serve it over a bed of uh, egg noodles after adding a little bit of sour cream to the to liquid in the pan. And uh, yeah, there's a lot you can do slow cooker wise. Um, it, change it up a little bit, maybe make stews instead of just making a, a pot roast. Um, but play around with your flavors. You'll find that maybe just some cinnamon, tomato paste, and some red wine may make a great Greek-style um, stew instead of um, you know just throwing it with some water and some beef broth and whatever vegetables you have laying around. Uh, play with it. It's such a versatile cut of meat. That and a flank steak, uh, they go so far. Um, enjoy it. And... Uh, you know, you can use that, a, a cheap cut of meat, if you just cook it long enough, um, it can actually taste just as I think the trick is low heat, right, Nick? Oh, yes, low and slow. Low and slow is the key with that. Yeah. And you can also, um, when braising, you want to kind of sear it and then put it in an oven covered and stuff like that, or you can use a slow cooker. That's one way of doing it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, low heat and moist. Low, moist heat is definitely a way to go. But when you break it down into smaller pieces, it's not like cooking the whole pot roast for six to eight hours, uh, four to eight hours, depending on your slow cook set on um, if you break it down into smaller pieces, it'll take a lot less time, and um, and and there's more you can do with the fat too. I mean, you can render it down, make a soup out of it. It flavors stock. You just take some water in a pot next to it and just make some soup, or you know, add some vegetables to it, and then just pull that big chunk of fat that comes in that pot roast right out that you cut, and and uh, that'll save you money on a good maybe two gallons of beef stock later on if you just want to add some bone to it. 
Let me tell you, I did that with the with the turkey. I made four different meals. <laughs> My husband's like, no more turkey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can, and it's amazing. A turkey goes pretty far. Um, yeah. First of all, you can—I mean, the wings on the turkey are great. So if you have some people that come over for a football game and you've had enough whole turkeys and you break them down, I mean, you don't need to make twelve dozen wings. You don't need one hundred and forty-four wings uh, with a turkey <laughs> wing. I mean, you just need about a dozen, and you're fine for the for the Monday Night Football game or Super Bowl. But um, another thing is, uh, you can. You take a turkey, and just as it's thawing is the best time to kind of slice and make your cutlets from the breast and just put those in a bag, and, and you'll be surprised. The turkey goes a long way. Uh, turkey is a great substitute for chicken. I talk to a lot of people that they're just like, I only eat white meat. I don't eat red meat, and I'm so sick of chicken. What, what can I do? I said, well, buy a turkey next time. I'm like, what am I going to do with Turkey. I say, you know, well, the only thing you have to do is treat it the same way you do a chicken, make the same recipes, and you'll be surprised. Sometimes the flavor is a little different. Uh, turkey is a stronger meat than chicken. Uh, chicken can be a little more delicate than turkey. So you can use some uh, bolder flavors on a turkey that you normally probably wouldn't use. Again. So experiment with it and play and have fun. I did. <laughs> Let's see. I saw a question about oils. Yeah. Okay. I found it, Lori. Okay. It's from um, Beth, a midlife woman. Um, she says, what is a healthy cooking or baking oil for desserts? When I use olive oil in desserts, it changes the taste for the worst. Um... How much oil are you really using? I think that anything can be healthy as long as you don't overdo it. Olive oil, I'm going to say, is probably not the best thing to use in desserts. Um, if, the, if the recipe calls for, like, a vegetable oil, maybe something a little lighter would be a canola oil or even a lighter version of that vegetable oil. When you start to chintz back on the oil, it does change the taste and probably even the texture of your batter, and eventually that shows in the end product once it's baked. And um, if you really need to, maybe try to melt some butter, believe it or not. It's probably more healthy than that heavy oil that you may be using. Apple sauce is a uh, great substitute for butter. Yes, I have that. I haven't tried it, so I don't have any first-hand experience in that. Um, on top of that, my specialties are more cooking than baking. Um, but actually, there is a, um, th there's a great, um, there should be a portion on the website that has some great substitutes. And I'm thinking maybe I'll give that a shot and uh, put that to the test and see if applesauce will hold up to, you know, as a substitute. Maybe I'll put that on there. Um, you can also get some great apps on your cell phone. I have, um, I have an app. Um, on my cell phone that um, will we'll tell you all about different substitutions and stuff. I almost want to create my own app <laughs> just, just because I come up with some crazy things. But um, I, I know there's one in particular that I used, and I don't know if I jotted it down uh, just so I didn't have my cell phone on the air with you. Uh, cooking conversions, and it converts measurements and has all kinds of substitutions. So I don't know if that's helpful. Um, but I think it has a little picture of a measuring cup um, if you go to your app store, wherever you get your things for on the thing that communicator <laughs> device that everybody carries now. It, um, it should be on there. And I like that. It has everything from a substitute for flour to pancake mix to whatever it is. And, uh, and I also have uh, that. It, it's in the back of the cookbook, and it should be on the recipe website as well of mine. If you want to just take a look online, and, and it's a friendly uh, mobile version of the website, too, is available that you can just, on your mobile phone, or automatically convert it, and you'll be able to read it quite easily when you need it in a pinch. Cool. Thanks. And to let everybody know, you know, if you don't know by now, 
when the show is live, we can't drop links in the description box. So once it um, processes as a regular video, I'll throw the links in so you'll have a link to Nick's Facebook page and a link to his website as well. Um, so you'll be able to check those things out. Um, Nick, was the, the app is called Cooking Conversions? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, there's the, the Cooking Conversions okay. is the name of it. Okay. And uh, I, I know I have an Android uh, base, so you can give it a shot. If not, um, all, all the conversions are also on my website at nickpiercefood.com. Okay. As well as the info for my TV show. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so we got a question and from Rob Reno. He always asks these types of questions. So um, he says, Nick, if you were going to make a very special dinner for each of the co-hosts of Renew and their spouse, what different dinner would you cook for each couple? <laughs> for each couple? <laughs> yes. All right. Um, well, Lori, let's start with you. Oh, never mind. You're married. Um, <laughs> I am too. <laughs> I haven't seen evidence of that yet. I was at Lori's wedding. Um, <laughs> yes, he was. Trust me, I'm married. <laughs> I don't know. If I was to cook... A meal for each of the hosts of Renew Show, what would it be? Well, um, let's see. Should we it, tell you what I we guess like? it would all depend on what each of you like. <laughs> yeah, why, why don't we do that? Let's go around the table. So now, now, now we get a little, a little more personal. What, uh, what food do you like? I like anything Italian. <laughs> okay, well, well, that's one of my specialties. I do, uh, I do a great piccata. I do a great parmesan. <laughs> I can make my own pasta, my homemade sauce, my great grandparents' uh, sauce recipe, and my nanny balls. So, um, I, if if it's Italian, I, it I, again, it would depend. Do you like more of a creamy uh, Italian meal, or more of like the red sauce Italian? Northern or southern is pretty much the the gist of it. I'm going with Marsala. Marsala, I can do a great veal Marsala then. Ooh. Um, but I, I, I up a little bit for you, Lori. Um, it would, it would have some nice uh, prosciutto ham over top with maybe a little bit of uh, mozzarella or some provolone melted on top of that. And uh, Jesse, I'm, I'm sure you'll enjoy that too. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. And uh, who else you got? Who else wants to tell me what they like? I like anything Mexican. <laughs> anything Mexican. Um, I do a really good... Um, I have two different things that I do really well. I make a homemade enchilada sauce. Mm. Um, I don't use corn tortillas, though. Um, I like the flour tortillas, but I use... A, a chuck or like a pot roast, and I actually pull the pull the meat and I mix it with pulled pork as well, um, with a very sharp uh, cheddar cheese with my homemade enchilada sauce, um, baked in the oven, hopefully to perfection. A little cilantro on top and some more melted cheese and enchilada sauce on that, and I make a nice dirty rice. I call it. Mm -hmm. Now you would have you 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 hit it on the nail from. Cleve, what do we got? He likes it flour. Hmm. Um, it's funny. Okay. I actually love, well, I love there you go. dishes too, except I don't like onions or tomatoes. Which you kind like? Of I'm sorry. So I love Mexican dishes, but I don't like onions or tomatoes. So that's the only thing. And every Mexican dish. I. <laughs> I, you know what's funny? I'm Italian and I don't like chunks of tomato. I'll eat ketchup and I'll eat tomato sauce. Um, but I'm the same way when it comes to uh, of, uh, or even pepper. Or do a fajita, I use the pepper just for the flavor and like the onion. But too soft, I just kind of put it aside. 
Um, when I was younger, I used to go to Mexican restaurants. I'd say, okay, give me a fajita and save all the vegetables. Um, right now, I, um, I just appreciate the flavor of it more now that I've had more uh, cooking experience. And I realize there is a perk for it. Um, what I have, um, uh, let's see, I guess since you don't like chunks of tomato, you don't like peppers, but you like said Mexican or Italian? Yeah, either one, actually. I lo love them both. Okay. Well, we'll pick some. Give me something to work with here. Hey, will you hand me my water? <laughs> um, okay, I mean chicken. Chicken is something that I have pretty much daily. So a way to dress that up. A way to dress chicken up? Uh, um, yep, there's a couple things you um, you can have, have a complete middle-aged burnout stoner, get a nice little blanket, put a pair of sills on its feet, and have it run. You know, it will drum it in. Or you can um, maybe a pink tutu if you want to bring it out to the ballet. Dress it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you dressed it up. <laughs> I dressed it up for you. What did you want? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had to wear a tutu. Um. <laughs> All right, All right, so I right, can actually, actually, you you know what'll really work, Lee, for you if you, if you really want to dress your chicken up. Um, how about wrap it in something? How about a chicken wrap? Um, whether you want to do a fresh chicken or you're just on the move and you want to just make something quick. Um, you can either use a can of this, maybe a little barbecue sauce, or maybe Dijon mustard, a um, little lettuce if you like the, the lettuce, and uh, or even if you just um, you know whole chicken that you just grill up real quick in a pan, and um, you know grill it up, maybe season it, salt, pepper, something mild, um, cut it up, and uh, put it in a wrap, um, undergarments this. And uh, you're ready to hit the road with it and take it out on a nice date. <laughs> okay. Um, Lori, did you have a question? Or? I see that our dear friend Susan, Taming the Food Beast, wants to know if you have any kind of simple, low-fat, low-calorie ways to thicken up soups and stews. Simple, low-fat, low-calorie ways. I'd have to look at the cornstarch to see if it's low-fat and low-calorie. What I typically do, though, is depending on how much soup you have, I would definitely just, instead of adding flour or anything like that, I would just take maybe about a cup of warm water and maybe about a tablespoon of cornstarch. Mix that in the warm water and then slowly add stirring the soup that you're adding it to little by little as it warms and the bubble and, and the soup is bubbling like that corn starts to it at a high enough temperature um, you'll notice it's going to start thickening up the longer it's in there so add it in short increments maybe about five minutes so you don't add too much um, but you get enough in there to, do, to desire thickness that, that you want and give that a shot because I don't think the cornstarch is uh, maybe a tablespoon of cornstarch and a, a gallon of soup is is going to um, uh, put you in a Fat Albert video. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we got a question from um, Zen Maiden One. She says, Nick, do you have any great chicken recipes which are low carb for the slow cooker? I would love some examples, especially Mexican, Jamaican, or Italian style. Um, recipes, low carb in the slow cooker style. Italians don't have slow cookers. <laughs> but it's not to say that you can adapt. Uh, Mexican wise, um, if you do maybe just like a chicken chili, and uh, I think that, that would work well. And. Um, 
I like maybe if you just uh, make a knock off of what I was telling Lori, what her ideal meal would be, or if I were to cook for each of the hosts on the Renew show, um, you maybe just take the chicken and making a layer of it in the slow cooker uh, with some broth, um, or even chicken stock here because uh, chicken broth is sometimes a lot saltier and it's a little heavier. It's made from a bouillon cube. It has more of that fat in it. Uh, um, with chicken stock, which is just pretty much the bone and some vegetables and boiled in water for a long time uh, to concentrate that flavor and drained, you can use some chicken broth. Uh, stock, I'm sorry, now I'm confused. Take stock, and uh, just so that it barely covers the chicken, but then uh, maybe about an hour before done cooking, uh, layer with um, some spinach or arugula is good, or even some broccoli. Give that a shot. If you want to add some Mexican flavoring to it, um, play around with different chilies and uh, different peppers to add that heat to it. Uh, give it a dash of hot sauce. Uh, again, an hour before it's done, and heat will infuse into the chicken. And uh, for low carb, I wouldn't recommend rolling it in a, uh, a tortilla or anything. Uh, maybe just breaking it up because it's going to pull very easily and break apart. Uh, maybe a corn taco shell would be best. Uh, heat it in the oven with a, take a spritz bottle or just maybe dampen it with a paper towel taco shells up so they don't fall apart and you get um, potato uh, corn chips instead of a taco shell. Give that a shot. Sounds good to me. <clears throat> well, good. That's what um, I'm here for. No. Um, I'd lose my just We're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, what's your favorite thing to cook for yourself? Um, favorite thing to cook for myself? I love veal piccata or veal, veal salt tambuca. Uh, veal piccata is just uh, small pieces of veal and um, it's uh, very tender, it's pounded thin, uh, put in a pan. A uh, little bit of uh, lemon juice at the end and right out, garnish with some capers. Spanish capers work best in my opinion, but you can use any caper. Even just uh, mash up some garlic cloves and spread them over the top if you don't have any capers. Um, veal salt and buca, um, I do it, it's called a veal salt and buca al romana. Um, and that's because I love Italian food. Uh, to me, that's just my ultimate way of um, just gorging myself. But I'll do a veal or a chicken saltambuca with um, it's much done almost the same way as you would do the piccata, um, but you flour one side, brown it, flip it over a little bit, put some spinach, some prosciutto, some provolone, and garlic and everything over it, and I, I guess I'm a healthy eater, me personally. <laughs> So if all three of uh, the hosts of Renew Show, uh, plus Jesse, um, would like to cook me my favorite meal, now you know what it would be. <laughs> Done. Huh. Okay, Nick, if I gave you a jicama, what would you make with a jicama? Hickama. A jicama? A jicama. A jicama. Not a hiccup, a jicama. A jicama. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a cross between a hiccup and an enema. I, I'm not sure what I would do with it. <laughs> Excuse me while I Google what this is supposed to be. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Unless you want... Are you Jewish? Is this a Jewish tradition or something? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Well, now give me an idea what it is. It's a, it may be some exotic fruit or it, something. It is a big, uh, looks like a big potato, and it's it's water based uh, between vegetable and fruit is what you know a jicama. 
I, I'd have to first I dress up as a moy and can snip it. <laughs> Before I let it get any closer, I don't know. I like, <laughs> I, don't I like, I like uh, cutting it up, right, and then uh, adding some lemon and a little bit of a little bit of chili powder, and that's how I eat it. But it's very good. I like it, but it's it looks water like based. A potato. Well, it looks like the, potato. Well, looks like the way you explain it, it sounds good. <laughs> I, I just don't have any experience with it. I don't know, Lori. Do they have any of those on the East Coast? You're on the West Coast, though. Hold on, Lori. Are those on the East Coast? Yeah, we have them here. <laughs> okay. Next time you come to visit, I'll make you some. <laughs> oh, great. I can't wait. Um, next year, I'm starting my um, Eliminate Hunger Tour on the West. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Never mind. I don't know where I go to, to avoid this one. Um, no, I, I'd actually have to say I'd give it a shot. I, I, I'd have never tried it, so I've never seen one. Yeah, maybe I have, but I just don't know what to do with it. So... What would I do with it? I'd dress up like a moink, sniff it, let it get me closer to make a secret service, and make sure it doesn't kill me. Uh, hey, <laughs> okay. Nick. Go ahead. Hey, Nick. Yes. We have a we have a viewer called, named Pete Rocks the Sleeve, and he lives alone and he doesn't eat large meals. So he wants to know if you could recommend some good flavorful meals that he could keep in the freezer other than lasagna or chili. Anything you want to make. I've been alone for a long time and I enjoyed it. Um, what you want to do is don't be afraid. Don't buy smaller portions just because you're not going to eat them all. Sometimes that costs you more money in the long run. Um, think your wallet. And what I would do is I would still buy a whole chicken, and I would buy, like, steak and a London broil and all that. Instead of thinking about the meal that you're going to heat up later, think about what you want to cook and how many things you could do with maybe two or three different cuts of meat. If I buy a couple pounds of ground beef and I split it up and portion it out and then freeze it, this way maybe some of it is made into hamburger patties, some of it is made into meatballs, and the rest of it is just left in chunks in smaller servings that I can make, like a taco or a small batch of chili for myself with. Um, that's actually the best way to go. This way, no matter what you feel like, I mean, if you had a whole chicken that you cut down um, and you had, we'll say, in a bag, legs and uh, wings and stuff like that, uh, then you can use them however you'd like. You can make a half a chicken one night if you just want to have like a pie and a drumstick or kind of leg, maybe save the breasts and save one breast whole and cut the other one down. Um, don't, don't limit your, your, your diet because you live alone. Eat everything you'd want to eat, but just get the big portion and you'll be surprised. Stuff lasts in the freezer for months. Um, take advantage of that so when you buy your food, you buy the whole chicken that lasts for a month just like some of the beef and, and two pounds of ground beef. I know when I was living alone, I mean, I, I would buy, when it was on sale, the three or five of beef and a whole chicken and even a turkey. I mean, I would sit there and I get a day. It was an event for me. I just go to the store and uh, spend a whole day just cutting it down. I, I, it was like a butcher shop in my kitchen. The table was covered in a big sheet of plastic and, the, and I'd sit there with a pork loin and a bread of cutlets and cubes and, and I would. I'd have a whole day of it. I mean, I'd dress up in silly costumes and have so much fun with it. I mean, <laughs> give it a shot. Don't limit your, 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 uh, what you want to eat just because you're by yourself. Cook everything you want to make and you'll be surprised how much money you save right. um, in the long run. As long as you wrap it and it's, it's good to be frozen. Um, maybe if you're going to be alone or you live alone and it's, uh, it's been a while and uh, this may be a, a something you're going to be doing for a while, um, get one of those vacuum sealer bag apparatus <laughs> just, just to seal everything in portions and then you can date it all and everything. Yeah. I, lo I love using mine and I will still put it in a Ziploc bag just so that I can protect it from the freezer burn in my freezer. <laughs> yeah, well, no, and, and that's not a bad idea. 
And you know what? If you take each piece of steak, like you have a big sirloin, you have sirloin steaks that are on sale, and they're, you know, they're huge. You can cut them down into smaller steaks. You get two small steaks out of one large one, and then you put them in the vacuum seal those, and then put them in a batch. Keep all your sirloins together from this batch. That's not a bad idea. I want that. Yeah. If you don't have a vacuum sealer, what's the best way to freeze meat? Um, vacuum hose. And then Just suck out the air with the vacuum. Art, 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 art. <laughs> anyway, no. Um, <laughs> or double uh, the what I would do bag. is <laughs> double. The, well, actually, you know what? The best thing to do is, um, and what I, it's just. Like we'll say if you take like a chicken breast and you cut it down into cutlets or you buy um, uh, maybe a bunch of ground beef and you make hamburger patties, take some freezer paper or uh, butcher paper works good, uh, wax paper, anything like that. Put each patty with two pieces of paper in between, not just one because one that seeps through and it still sticks to each other and then have part of the paper in one patty and then the other one just split them apart. They peel apart a lot of these between them. Uh, then wrap them in a Then put them in the black bag, a Ziploc bag. And uh, that would probably work best. You want to keep as much air away from the meat as possible. Okay. Um, all right, we had a... Uh, okay, first, so... Rose, um, Susan says she likes her jicamas raw. I do too. Yeah, uh, high five. There you go. That's <laughs> um, and Nick, we got a question from uh, Aaron Smith, and he asks. He says, "Yesterday I made shrimp alfredo with beef and pork chorizo. The chorizo never ground up or set up like ground beef. I wanted chunks. Mm. I obviously picked the wrong Mexican sausage. What do you recommend?" <laughs> Chorizo. <laughs> uh, chorizo. Um, it's a great sausage. What I would have done was probably brown it up first in some olive oil. Um, what I would do is, or you can use a blend of the two. Um, if you're cooking on gas, I definitely recommend putting some olive oil with the butter because the temperature you're going to be uh, heating it at, um, the butter's just going to burn by itself. Um, add a little bit of olive oil to the pan if you're cooking over gas uh, and butter. Uh, brown the sausage up on a very high heat and uh, tossing it quite often so that it browns evenly. Set it aside and then I would worry about your shrimp and the alfredo um, and then incorporate them later on when you get a sauce and a big skillet together. Sometimes it's not necessarily what it is, it's sometimes just a method, and tweaking the method will actually help. Alright, sounds good. So I actually have a question for you. Um, if there's someone out there that doesn't know how to cook or isn't comfortable with cooking, What's a good place to start? You know, they don't want to keep eating out every day or buying packaged meals. So how how can they get started? Um, I'd say go to a big box store, uh, get some decent cookware and a fire extinguisher, <laughs> and then um, go to the other side of the big box store and get cheap cuts of meat and just take your time with it. Don't overheat anything. We don't want any major disasters. Uh, buy a good cookbook. Um, watch the watch the cook shows. Um, there's a lot of great cooking shows. Um, some of them may not be as good as mine, um, but uh, you find some out there that you like better. And um, you know, pay attention to what maybe sometimes it's just one or two recipes um, that you may be ten or twelve different recipes of your own with. And, and try that. I, and uh, I, I would recommend a couple different cookbooks. First of all, um, The Joy of Cooking. It is a book maybe this thick. It was my first cookbook, and I still refer to it to this day um, just to look for some 
basic something or other, or even something that I've maybe I'll find the recipe the kosher potato that they're talking about on the West Coast there. Um, but yeah, I think that would be um, a good first cookbook. And uh, you know, all recipes follow, you know, everything as is, and then start to adapt it. Don't just dive in, and uh, don't be afraid if you mess it up. Uh, don't cook for the first time um, for uh, the the first date or the first person you're ever having over that you're going to cook for. Um, <laughs> try it on a younger sibling. Um, <laughs> I would definitely try it on a younger sibling or some in the family you may not want around. I've got a question about plate up. How would you plate? How do you plate up a plate? I mean, you've got your you got your protein, you got your vegetable. What else do you pair things up with? If you well, uh, what you do is you look at it as uh, it's almost like an empty canvas, and you got to look at the food first when it's the plating. Um, typically, you you want balance. You want it to look proportional, just like making a, a masterpiece or work on a canvas. Um, the plate is blank, and you know what the meal is that you're going to put in this. Um, a lot of times you go to different places. Some things are served on long plates. Some things are served on round plates. Some things are served on squares and isosceles triangles and all that. Um, what I would do is just keep in mind how you want to present it, the color, uh, the balance, and uh, break it down into two main things, your focal point, which may be your main part of the dish, and then what would, what would be called your garnish. And how your garnish and how present you want it, or, you know, sometimes uh, you go to some restaurants and you see places they stack up in little ring mold, and uh, they're all different ways of doing it. Um, what you think, you know, whatever you think would be attractive and appetizing um, would be the best way to plate whatever meal it is you want to present. Um, you really, um, you first taste with your eyes and then your nose before it even gets to your mouth. Um, and you wouldn't put a white with a so, yellow. Would you, you would put like a green and a yellow or whatever. The reason I'm asking, let me tell you why I'm asking. I When I mm -hmm. first came to California, I made some things, and one of the one of the ladies looked at my plate, and she go, at, or I was plating everybody, and I put the food out, and she said, "Oh no, honey, you never put yellow and white together. You always put your your vegetables as green and orange, then a white." And I'm like, "Okay, okay I'm sorry, I did something wrong. I've been cooking for 18, 20 years." I don't know. I have some peeves of my own too. Um, for some reason, in lighting and decorating, even red and green don't go together. And uh, my background is in lighting, and I never liked the way red and green looked on the stage. So to me, it's just like, for some reason, in food it looks better. But maybe that was just her personal opinion. Um, I don't know. There's some colors that I probably wouldn't use together, but I think if it looks good on a plate and it looks appetizing, why not go for it? I wouldn't yeah, restrict I yourself just because someone, <laughs> one person out of the 18, you said you'd be cooking 18 years? Just because yeah. one person out of 18 years didn't like the way two colors work together. In fact, white's the color. Uh, but just because one color didn't work white, you know, everything goes with white. I thought there I was a rule maybe about. that I was not aware of. <laughs> no. No. I wouldn't brown in a plate that's like a toilet bowl. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I think there's very few ways that you don't want to plant things. But, I mean, be creative. Hmm. Thank you. I have a question from... No problem. There's a question from Sunflower81975. She's a mom of some young children and wants to know, <clears throat> how do you cook for children that are picky? Ah, uh, this, is, this is a fun one. There's a couple things you get with this. And I look for many picky uh, kids. Is it vegetables that you want them to eat or meat you want them to eat? 
And that's the big thing. I don't know if there's a way to ask her and get some clarification, whether it's meat or vegetables. Can you elaborate maybe on both? Um, but I'll, yeah, I will. I'll, I'll explain a little bit of everything. Um, what happens is sometimes it's a thing and sometimes just a flavor thing. Um, and this is this is what I found, and it's just it's a psychological thing where I have, a, for example, I have a young nephew, and he will not he loves peas, but he will not eat frozen peas or fresh peas, only canned peas. Well, here's the problem. You buy a big can of peas, he only eats maybe tablespoons out of that big can, and he doesn't eat leftovers either. So who else eats these peas? The garbage man. So what you do is you take the frozen peas. Now, canned peas are the furthest thing from anything fresh, for the next best thing. And then you have, you know, which is always best. But the canned peas are soft, they're mushy. So I had to look at the texture that he liked. And even though he liked, he liked that overcooked flavor about him. So I was cooking for him one night and he wanted peas. Now, I have never had canned peas in my kitchen. But I had frozen peas. So I put a can out and I put it on the counter. I said, sure, you want peas? Here's peas. I took the can out because I know he wasn't going to eat frozen peas. Then I took the real bag of frozen peas out, put them in a pot, and I had him sit for a good maybe half hour, overcooked them like crazy to the point where they were like that mushy green pea color that you get in a can and not that vibrant green that you normally get when they're fresh or frozen. Threw a little salt, over-salted them, and he loved them as if they were canned peas. So... Sometimes you just need to substitute some stuff or hide it in some way. Um, instead of, um, if maybe they're not a big fan of carrots, spice up the carrots a little bit with maybe um, uh, maple syrup and brown sugar work because then it tastes sweet to them and you still get that beta carotene into their mouth that you want them to eat. Um, you can also try... Um, Combinations, sometimes maybe just some little tiny perlinins in the peas or spinach um, is great. You can add a little garlic to it, butter, a little bit of lemon. Uh, spinach will do different things that if you find something that they like in a vegetable that they may not like, um, try putting them together so that they like it. As far as meats, meats are a little more, uh, they're a little trickier. The problem you have with meats is chicken, is always chicken, beef is always beef, pork is always pork, lamb is always lamb, fish is always fish. Um, if, if you're good at cooking the meat, then or any protein you make, then even people that don't like it may like it. So sometimes maybe um, it's not necessarily in the person eating it. I just say it may be your fault in the way you're cooking it. Uh, try um, undercooking some proteins like or lamb uh, so that it has a little more of what the meat actually is because maybe you're overcooking it. Step back and criticize your own cooking. And I guarantee you, like, I had folks that I've met out here uh, that do not like fish and will not. I cook fish for them. They're amazed. They want me to keep cooking it for them. Um, there's a big difference between homemade fish, even though it's frozen, and red lobster down the street. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's in the way it's prepared. And uh, But you need to find out first whether it's a texture issue or a taste. And then if it is texture, then you just make the same thing, have a different texture. Or if it's taste, you just need to line a little bit and make it something that they're more familiar with. If they like lollipops, then maybe they'll like the mixture of carrots. That's great. All right. Um, we got a question coming in. Actually, kind of goes back to your peas. Um, Rob Reno asks, I know fresh is better, but eating frozen is eating frozen veggies also healthy? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Frozen vegetables are flash frozen. Um, in some cases, sometimes frozen vegetables may be healthier than fresh vegetables. 
I read a study, um, I'm going to say a little over a month ago, exactly where I read it, I'd let you know, where um, there were some bacteria or parasites that may be in fresh vegetables that if you don't wash them well enough, um, they may still be around even uh, after the cooking process. The only way to really kill certain parasites or their larvae anyway is if they're frozen. So that's something to keep in mind. So yeah, I'd say overall, um, it, and again, certain vegetables freeze better than others. Um, to me, personally, uh, canned corn tastes better than frozen corn, but fresh corn, corn all that. I would always go for the frozen version of over anything canned because in order to put it in a can and and then you want to hit to eat again and you're, you're double cooking it and then by the time it's leftovers it's heated three times over by then. So um, I'm going to say that uh, fresh is best, frozen in, in some cases may even be better. And less expensive. Yeah. 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 In some cases, it is less expensive. Um, a lot of times, people don't live next to a farmer's market or a farm where they're growing, and they have to go to the major food store, which is three more parties in between by the time it gets to the checkout line in your basket. Mm -hmm. um, so you frozen goes pretty much right from a plant right into the freezer to your basket and you have a lot less um, uh, fresh vegetables way more they cost more to transport their shelf life is as long the bottom is more because they know they have to make their money off the first two-thirds they sell because they're going to throw a third out in most cases um, we have a question from a uh, from Pete Rocks the Sleeve uh, he says he's making chicken soup tomorrow he doesn't want to put noodles in it he has leftover spaghetti squash. Will it be a mistake to add it in? He says it seems wrong somehow. <laughs> in a way, it can be very wrong. That That is really, no pun intended, a recipe that is a disaster. It's going to happen. Um, the, the problem that you have is when adding a squash or a potato to a soup is in order to heat it up and get it to temperature and get the flavor into the soup, typically it'll deteriorate and you have a very thick, heavy, starch-filled um, liquid that really isn't good for much else, but um, uh, wallpaper glue is one use for it. <laughs> um, you can use it to spackle holes in the wall is another. And uh, depending on how long it takes to dry, um, you could seal the cracks in your way with, depending on how starchy it gets. Uh, sometimes if you wring it out, you can also use it to, to stiff your shirts up just to starch them a little bit. Um, potato soups are hard to make, and I think adding a squash like that to a soup, even if it's a leftover, it's already been cooked right down. Um, you're not going to get much flavor out of it. And uh, it's not going to be anything that you want to eat. What could he do with leftover squash? Um, leftover squash can be uh, used for a bunch of things. Um, I would actually do, it all depends on your taste. I would actually take a look online for just some, you can just Google leftover squash recipes. And you'll be amazed at, even though no one thinks it, You'll be amazed at what you can do with it. That would be a whole hour <laughs> show just alone on what to do with left, with squash. Period. Never mind the leftovers. Um, you can mash them up and make. Um, and what I would actually do, and just to give you one idea, uh, without going into a hundred, um, take it, mash it up a little bit, uh, season it with some um, paprika, salt, pepper, and uh, put some brown. A dollop of butter, put it, um, put it in little uh, or little soup onto a sheet pan or a baking tray. Uh, put it in the oven, broil it um, for maybe five minutes. Let the top turn golden brown. Uh, you're going to have a great uh, baked squash. It's going to taste nice with the brown sugar. It's going to um, 
it, it, it should taste great, just the way the brown sugar and the butter come together on the top of that with some of the other seasoning. Mmm, that sounds Give like that a, a shot. Like a potato. Mm. Um, so what would it, you... Yeah, it's almost like a roasted, baked, uh, roasted mashed or twice-baked potato seasoned or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so in his case, since he has this soup he's going to make, but he doesn't want to put noodles in his chicken soup, what would you suggest is something that he can throw in instead of noodles that would kind of have that same texture or consistency? Um, instead of starch, but you want something filling that, that uh, starch will give you, um, try cracking an egg into it. Just break an egg and almost make like almost like a drop soup with it. Uh, give that a shot right before the soup is done, though. Don't don't get the egg in there for the full maybe hour or so that you're making the soup for. Um, um, just maybe the last two minutes. Just take an egg and one at a time in there, and then you can ladle each serving out with a boiled egg right in the bowl. Or, um, you know, you can break up and make slur around in there just like they do the egg drop soup. Uh, give it a shot fork. As you start to, if you want to do like a stringy egg type thing like an egg drop soup, break it in a burst and uh, whisk it with a fork and then pour the egg through a fork. If you have a larger fork or a spider or some type of mesh colander, just keep it moving around and pour it into the soup. So that it gives you those long strings of egg, and uh, that that'll that'll be a great substitute for your noodles at that point. I knew I should have ate before I, before I came on here. I knew it. I'm so hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, well, Rose, what are you going to eat tonight then? I have uh, I have turkey soup I made. I'm just going to warm it up and have some turkey soup. Okay. Well, if you have some <laughs> egg, try that. Give it a shot. Put a little egg I in will. there and let me know what you think. I will. Sounds delicious. Do is I like to add a lot of crushed uh, black pepper into that because it gives a little spice and it actually brings that egg flavor into the soup a little better. And it's got protein, so yeah. Yay. <laughs> That sounds really good. I never would have thought. Um, all right, so <laughs> I've been trying to skip this question. Um, so, Brooke, you're um, a friend from, she says she's from Columbus, Ohio. She wants to know, what. how do you feel about people who don't like onions? She's questioning whether I'm human or not. So she wants to... <laughs> I saw that, but I thought you were going to ignore it. <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything wrong with not liking onions. Um, I'm picky about my onions, even even myself. I, I am picky about them. I um I I'm not too fond of that slimy texture that they may have. I like them either crisp or fried, um, or I like them cut up so small that they just the flavor just infuses in your cooking. But you don't have that onion texture. To me, maybe it's more of a texture issue, but I love the flavor of them. So, Brooke, is it a matter of flavor or texture? And that, that's what I love. Like, maybe I have some pointers on how to get around that because I've been dealing with that myself. <laughs> well, I think for, she just loves the I don't know if there's a way to. Believe. Yeah, that's all. She just likes to tease me. But for me, it's <laughs> everything. I, if I taste an onion in something, I will probably throw up. And so it, it's the texture. And I used to not eat peppers either um, and garlic for the same reason. But now I can eat peppers. I can eat garlic. I just can't touch an onion. When someone cuts a raw onion, I can't take the smell. They, they're just disgusting in every way. Oh, I love onion. <laughs> Me too. Oh, well, that's I interesting. It. I love onion in everything. And hmm. I'm someone, if I can handle the texture, I'll eat anything. Like I have no problem with the thought of eating an eyeball or something like that. Like I don't, I'll eat anything, but I just need the texture to be right. But on, uh, onions, I can't. Okay. Do. <laughs> so, so you're you're great for Fear Factor if you can eat an, an eyeball, but yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Onion get that's interesting. But if they give okay. me an onion, I fail. <laughs> hey, it's actually a delicacy. Uh, when we when we make the cow uh, heads in Mexico, you know, mm -hmm. the eyeballs is yeah. a delicacy. Delicacy. <laughs> Well, what I understand, they absorb sure. flavor so well. So, I don't I don't, know. I'm sure they absorb some of the is, but once you break one, it just explodes in your mouth, and I don't know what it is about that. Well, I've tried it once, <laughs> but um, never again. Mm. <laughs> hey, Nick, going back to onions, <laughs> you know... <laughs> You know how you can buy a bag of chopped onions and they're in the freezer section? <clears throat> how yeah. do you, what's the best way to, like if you come home from work and you need to use them in a pinch, how do you thaw them out so that it doesn't make your meal like soggy? Because that happens so often. I grab the bag of onions to stir fry them and because they're frozen and I, I try to heat them with some hot water but they get real mushy. Like frozen yeah. onions, they're great. That's but always uh, that, that, that's a rough one sometimes because um, your best bet is just to put them in a pan, um, heat them up, and when the moisture wick away from them, a little kosher salt will help dry them out, and then um, drink. Let them sit on a paper towel before you add them to the dish that you want to use them in. That's a good one. Thank you. All right. Well, we have a couple minutes left, Nick. So why don't you, okay, and especially for the people there. who showed up a little late, just tell tell them about your show and if you have the information about when it's going to air, what station, or at least your website. Just whatever you want to um, tell them, so we can um, keep following you and support you. Oh, of course, yes. And um, my website is nickpiercefood.com. Uh, all the information about my TV shows on there. The name of the TV show is Home Cooking Overhaul. It's uh, premiering in two weeks on DATV Channel 5. And uh, it's, it's, that's the local network around here. You'll be able to stream it on DATV.org. And uh, in your local area, other stations will be syndicating. Um, so keep an eye out for listings. And uh, I'll also make an up-to-date list on my website of what stations will be carrying it in your area throughout the United States. Until then, you will be able to see each thing as it airs on uh, DATV.org. The link on my website, uh, NickPierceFood.com. Uh, Facebook, Home Cooking Overhaul. And uh, um, what else do you need to know? We have, uh, uh, it's coming out in two weeks. Um, we have uh, the uh, charity I'm running right now is to um, next year it's the Stop Hunger Tour um, I know surprise I don't think I even told Lori about this yet um, next season I'm going to be hitting the road um, and um, I'm doing this strictly off donations that I get on the website there's a donate uh, button on the Stop Hunger Tour where I'm going to be going to different food pantries. Uh, this started when I shot an episode for a local food bank here where they had no idea what all the stuff that gets donated. And uh, this is not just something that you should be mindful of during the holidays when most people always want to get food banks, but I'm going to this in like the summer um, when uh, a lot of people aren't thinking of food banks and uh, what the you know, people need. So um, I went there and I shot an episode just using ingredients from the food pantry. And it's amazing what you can actually do with a bunch of canned and um, really cheap cuts of meat. Uh, I do a lot of work with budgeting and saving money and getting people away from the drive through window and cooking at home. And uh, so I'm hoping that uh, if anyone wants to help out with that, you can go to my website. And again, uh, the Hunger Tour for next year. Donate there, NickPierceFood. Dot com and uh, what else do any other viewers have any questions or you can um, follow my adventures along on facebook.com slash home cooking overhaul okay and I just want to remind everyone that we're going to have all of the um, the links in I'll say tomorrow morning once 
Google finalizes this as a video, I'll have the links in. Of course, you can um, you know, send us an email if you don't see it for some reason. Um, but everything should be in in the morning. And um, yeah, we have a couple more that maybe we didn't get to that we just don't have the time now. So you know, maybe we can just even answer them off air. You know, just actually responding to their comments that would be great. But um, yeah, besides that, just want to thank you, Nick, for for coming on. It's thank been you. Great, you know, having you. And well, thanks thank for having everybody. me. I, I love being. I hope that uh, your viewers walked away with a lot of information in this help. Yeah, I think so. I think um, you know we fought through all those technical difficulties <laughs> in the beginning and had a great show, very informative. And um, you know, said thank you, everybody out there. Thank you for watching. Thank you for um, just supporting the show. Thank you for your great questions and. We'll see you guys next week when we're going to have a question and answer. Ask the host. So come prepare with your questions. You can ask Lori and Rose anything you want, and they will answer any question you have about them. Lori and Rose, Mary, anything you will ever want and to do, Khalif. come and ask, Khalif. hit them hard with your questions, and we're going to have a good time next week. All right, guys. See you then, and have a good night. Bye, guys. Bye, Nick.